بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم ٹو انگلش فور فائیو فور دس از لیکچر تھرٹی ٹو اینڈ وی ہیو بین ڈسکسنگ ٹی ایس ایلیٹ وی ہیو ڈسکسڈ ٹی ایس ایلیٹس ٹریڈیشن وی ہیو ڈسکسڈ از ان پرسنل تھیری آف آرٹ وی ہیو ڈسکسڈ سو فار how Eliot uh, uh, viewed the function of the critics and we have discussed his uh, objective relative objective correlative and his theory of uh, sensibility unification of sensibility and dissociation of sensibility uh, we're going to discuss get an overall view of uh, what uh, as a result of these theories they have discussed almost four or five theories and no critic that we have studied so far has given us so much material and so much uh, you know uh, thinking to be uh, done there's so many theories that Eliot has provided us with usne hame dekhe na itni sari theories de di tradition ke bare mein de di ki why should we stick to tradition he has also told us about the impersonal theory of art usne hame bataya ki we have to uh, the poet has to keep his personality separate from the uh, work he is trying to create he believes that uh, the emotion and the personality they should be uh, separate uh, from the process of creation he believes that a poet for an artist and for a poet to uh, grow Uh, creatively it is necessary that he keeps these two things separate that uh, he continues uh, to uh, uh, sacrifice uh, his self and there is a process of continuous self extinction that should go on for an artist to grow to scheme personal theory of art he, he also believed that there has to be an objective correlative that is something should be present some object some situation some sequence of events it should be present within the within the within the work of art which would help us to object which will which would help us to project our own emotions onto that uh, object okay because according to eliot the direct expression of emotions is not uh, something that would be uh, that would uh, speak good for the poet for a poetry for a piece of literature uh, it for it to be of excellence it is necessary that there's no direct expression of emotions or feelings in it okay and we also discuss this theory of unification of sensibility and dissociation of sensibility um uh, he was against this uh, romantic cut of mind we have discussed it many times times in almost every lecture that he didn't believe ke jo romantics hain they believed in subjectivity objectivity uh, was uh, his uh, eliot's a core point he believed that a poet has to be objective he believed that there has to be the sensibility present there has to be this fusion of um, uh, a fusion of thoughts and feelings and emotions and uh, logic and it, it, there has to be thoughts have to be part of feeling and feelings have to be a part of thought these things they have to have an amalgamation these things they have to be together you cannot separate things uh, emotions from feelings and feelings from emotions and thoughts from emotions and, emotion and thoughts from feelings from thoughts the thoughts have to be a part of feeling and the feelings have to be a part of thought they have to combine together in such a way that the, there is a complete uh, a blurring of bound reads there you cannot distinguish between them to get a jab tak to unification of sensibility english poetry mein rahi hai tab tak to poetry jo thi wo um, successful thi achhi thi but jaise hi uh, unification of sensibility khatam hui aur dissociation of sensibility aa gayi hai to tab se hi poetry jo hai wo mediocre hoti gayi thi to is silsile mein he believes that the metaphysical poets they are um, metaphysical poets aur uske baad phir ye ab apni baat karte hain aur apne se aage aane wale logon ki baat bhi karte hain ki they are the poets who have uh, something new and original to say isliye wo victorians ko romantics ko aur new classics ko in sab ko wo bura kehte hain because they do they have this dissociation of sensibility in them either they were reflective or they were intellectual they was either they were all about emotions or they were all about uh, thoughts they could not combine the two together اس کو ملٹن پہ بھی یہ اعتراض ہے کہ ملٹن واز آل فیلنگ اینڈ ہی سی ڈرائیڈن اور سیمیل جانسن دے ور آل تھاٹ سو ڈرائیڈن بیسکلی وہ تو ملٹن ڈرائیڈن کا کمپیریزن ہی کرتا ہے ٹھیک ہے اور اس کے بعد وہ کہتا ہے کہ بیکاز آف دس ریزن بیکاز دے واز دو دے واز نو دس امالگمیشن آف دیز ٹو تھنگس پریزنٹ ان پوئٹری تو اس کی وجہ سے پوئٹری کا ڈاؤن فال آتا ہے ٹھیک ہے کیونکہ ہمیں پتہ ہے کہ پوئٹری سب سے پہلے پوئٹری بہت زیادہ امپورٹنٹ تھی پوئٹری کے بعد پھر ڈراما امپورٹنٹ ہوا ڈراما کا ڈاؤن فال ہوا پوئٹری پھر امپورٹنٹ ہوئی رومانٹکس کے ساتھ لیکن اس کے بعد پھر اس کا ڈاؤن فال آیا وکٹورین ایرا میں تو ناول زیادہ امپورٹنٹ ہو گیا تھا اور اس کے بعد پھر یہ ایلیٹ کے زمانے سے ہی اسٹارٹیڈ یو نو دس سوٹ آف رین اے سانگ آف پوئٹری پھر ماڈرنزم میں چلا جائے گا اینڈ اٹ گوز آن اینڈ آن سو فائنلی ان آڈر ٹو ڈسکس واٹ ہی تھنکس واٹ واٹ ڈفرینٹ پیپل تھنک اور واٹ آئی تھنک اور واٹ یو شوڈ نو دیٹ از ایلیٹس کانٹریبیوشن ٹوڈس لٹری کرٹیسزم 
अच्छा जी Eliot's criticism seems to be assured of an even more permanent and significant place in the history of English literature than his poetry. उसकी poetry को बहुत ज़्यादा credible माना जाता है, वो excellence के level पे पूरी उतरती है, but even then, people believe that Eliot has to uh, has to be acknowledged for the criticism that he has written. ठीक है? हमने ये discuss किया हुआ पहले भी कि Eliot का Eliot ka khayal tha ke criticism, what was criticism according to T.S. Eliot? T.S. Eliot believed that criticism was not, you know, just uh, analyzing and uh, commentating and expo exposing different parts of a piece of literature. He believed that the whole purpose of literature was to make people aware. He believes that there has to be an outside authority present, both in the process of creativity and in the process of criticism as well. And poets and the critics, they have to listen to that outside authority. Okay? He believes that the function of the critic was to um, discuss, to reveal whatever there was to be revealed in the piece of literature and to improve the taste of the artist, uh, of the reader, sorry. So, when the reader's taste improve ho jayega aur unke saamne aap sare facts jo hai, sare statements jo hai, wo lay kar denge, they'll make their own decisions. But here, Eliot also believes ke critics aam taur pe, they, uh, they are not that, uh, they're generally pretentious because they are floating their own knowledge. They flaunt their own knowledge. They, they're not much concerned about uh, how original their criticism is because we, if you remember that we, uh, we read the statement by Eliot where he said ke, uh, most of the time what happens is that the nine-tenth of the poetry, if the poetry is of mediocre kind, the nine-tenth of the criticism that is written about that piece of poetry would be pretentious and the piece of poetry would be far above it. Okay? So, in this case, the the critics were pretentious the, and they, are, um, they were not doing things of a good quality. So basically, apne, wo, jo statements that readers were saying to the readers to explain the things and confuse them confuse them. So, he was of a different kind of a critic. His theories are very profound and you know that he didn't write a book. He generally wrote a criticism of someone who 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 wrote a theory nikalti thi jaise uski theory of objective core relativity humne padhi thi to usme it was not that he was uh, writing this essay to uh, you know prove this theory or something like that it was just an essay that he was writing on hamlet and his problem that it was the problem of hamlet why did he procrastinate it what was the problem with him that he had to uh, you know prolong the decision that he had to make to usme phir hame ye usne theory objective core relativity ki di thi ki there, there is this problem in hamlet that hamlet has an emotion of disgust in him and the emotion is so uh, overwhelming that the object on which the emotion is supposedly directed, the object or the character on which the emotion is supposedly directed, it's, it's very insignificant, it's very trivial. So the emotion overwhelms the character on which the emotion is directed. Because it overwhelms that character, that is why आपको उसकी जो होनी चाहिए थी कथार्सिस होना चाहिए था हैमलेट का वो नहीं हो सकता और जब वो कथार्सिस नहीं हो पाता तो उसकी जो फीलिंग्स हैं वो they turn inside him ठीक है वो तो ना कि उसी पे हमला कर देती हैं and that causes his problem so for him just you know the the point I'm trying to make here is that he's he has given you an idea कि ये हैमलेट की प्रॉब्लम थी और इससे फिर ये थेरी निकलती है। It was not as if he was advocating this theory, but this was the theory that he had for this particular play of Shakespeare. So when he had this play, तो उसके बाद फिर ये ऑटोमैटिकली ये थेरी इतनी ज़्यादा सक्सेसफुल हुई, because it made sense. So इसकी जितनी भी थेरीज़ थी, चाहे वो ट्रेडिशन के बारे में थी, चाहे वो इम्पर्सनल आर्ट के बारे में थी, चाहे वो ऑब्जेक्टिव को रिलेटिव के बारे में थी, साथ सेंसिबिलिटी, यूनिफिकेशन और डिसोसिएशन ऑफ सेंसिबिलिटी के बारे में थी, जितनी भी थी, वो इसी तरह फेमस हुई हैं, ठीक है? हमने उसके एसेज जरूर पढ़े हैं, but there was not a single book, you know, discoursing about how criticism should be done or how literature should be viewed or something. But even then, though he has not, you know, claimed to do that. Uh, but he, his way of looking at literature, his way of appreciating literature is now considered, I mean, the most influential, even now, today. कि tradition पे belief लोगों का दोबारे से इसकी वजह से आए वरना आम तौर पे तो ये होता है कि tradition को जो लोग follow कर रहे होते हैं उनकी originality को question किया जाता है उनकी उनकी creativity को question किया जाता है पर जो elite की theory है उसके हिसाब से तो फिर आप जो tradition the one who's sticking to tradition is the one who's the most sensible and the most profound poet so uh, we have to uh, admit to his significant place in the uh, history of English literature and his poetry is not on the same rank though it's good as well 
the wasteland is considered to be one of the most um, uh, accurate uh, uh, depiction of um, a human race and it's, it's very good but still it's not of the same stature. So he played a significant part in the reassessment of the past writers to suit the modern sensibility. Dekhi ji, isne ye baat bilkul shuru mein apne essay mein batai thi hume ki there has to be this reassessment of the past literature every hundred years or so. A critic would come and he would reassess the past literature. What would be the need to reassess the past literature? The need to reassess the past literature is to reform the ideas that already exist. Because 100 saal guzar gaye, 200 saal guzar gaye, 150 saal guzar gaye, nayi generation aagi hai, uske different halat hai, uske different mindset hai, wo aur tarah se sochti hai. So जब वो और तरह से सोचती है तो उसके लिए लिटरेचर की एप्रिसिएशन भी डिफरेंट होगी वो लिटरेचर की डिफरेंट तरह से एप्रिसिएशन करेगी ठीक है उसकी सोशल कंडीशंस उस जमाने से बहुत डिफरेंट है सो उसकी एप्रिसिएशन जो है वो डिफरेंट होगी सो द क्रिटिक हैज टू मेक रूम फॉर दैट सो ही हैज डन दिस वेरी थिंग ही हैज चेंज आर आइडिया अबाउट हाउ द पास्ट लिटरेचर वॉज रिटर्न मेटाफिजिकल पोइट्स को पहले सारे लोग कहते थे दे वर प्रिटेंशियस एंड आर्टिफिशियल एंड एवरीथिंग इलियट ने कहा कि नो दे वर द मोस्ट प्रोफाउंड पोइट्स दे वर द मोस्ट सेंसिबल पोइट्स बिकॉज दे हैड दिस यूनिफिकेशन ऑफ सेंसिबिलिटी इन देम दे एक्सप्रेस आइडियाज इन द मोस्ट नॉवल वेज और वो इस तरह का मेटाफर ढूंढते थे जिसमें सारी सेंसेज इकट्ठी हो जाती थी इस तरह का मेटाफर ढूंढते थे जो इस तरीके से अपनी बात कहते थे इन वर्ड्स में अपनी बात कहते थे ऐसी फ्रेजेज यूज करते थे जो कि सारी फैकल्टीज को एड्रेस करते थे होल प्रोसेस of creativity the whole process of creativity involves the entire soul of man along with all the faculties to isliye wo metaphysical ke bare mein usne hamara view change kiya to usne reassessment ka process of course usne zarur kiya usne sare past literature ko reassess kiya for the modern reader so that we can look at the past literature from a different angle not because people before us have told us to look at certain poets in this way we have to make our own assessment according to the mindset that we have at the present time so his anti-romantic insistence on an outside authority as against the inner voice brought a fresh attitude to English criticism. He absorbed various influences from the past which absorbed them so well that they have become a part of him. Therein lies his greatness. Uh, anti-romantic thumb. And romantics believed in the self, in the inner core. They believe the her emotion, jo hai, it arises from the heart. Okay, this is powerful uh, uh, overflow of emotion, or who automatically apna path ko choose karega. Aapko yaad hoga ki words wat ne kaha tha ki aap emotions ko um, college ne bhi yehi kaha tha ki emotions ko kisi uh, you can't uh, make them move through the artificially laid pipes. They'll flow themselves. They'll find their own way. So when they find their own way, it means that they'll find their own way of expressing themselves as well. He uh, alien. It was um, against this, of course. He believed there has to be an outside authority. जो artificially laid pipes जिनको words बत कहता था कि जो art meter है या rhyme है या diction जो भी कहते हैं उसको आप वो artificially laid pipes थे. There were artificial techniques used to control the emotions. तो words में तो ये कहता था. Eliot कहता है कि there has to be something outside, an outside authority present. जो आपको बताए कि चीजों को कैसे करना है. चीजें आपके अंदर से निकल के खुद से अपना रास्ता नहीं बनाएंगी. You have to define a way. You have to devise a method. ठीक है? He absorbed various influences from the past. उसे बहुत से past writers को observe किया और उनको absorb किया, उनको copy किया, उनकी बातों को copy किया. और लेकिन उसने ये नहीं किया कि उसने उनको imitate किया है, बल्कि उसने उनको इस तरह follow किया कि वो उसकी अपनी theology का, उसके अपनी philosophy का एक हिस्सा बन गए. देखिए जी, जब हमने tradition की बात की थी, तो उसमें यही इसने Eliot का अपना भी यही point था कि you should follow the past, but it should not be an imitation, it should not be a copying. The past should redirect the present. The past should redirect the present, and the present should modify the past. दोनों को एक दूसरे का हिस्सा बन जाना चाहिए. The same thing he applied to himself. He learned from the past and make the past a part of himself. Eliot belonged to the line of poets, critics extending from Sydney down to the modern age. There were many poets who were critics as well. ये बात हमने discuss की थी मैथ्यू आनंद में भी कि there are people who start out as poets and then they decide that the poetry was, you know, not good enough or maybe they were not good enough or whatever the reason may be. They might turn bitter or whatever. So they turn bitter and they start on the line of criticism. So there were many starting from Philip Sidney and down to the modern age. A line that includes Ben Johnson, Dryden, Dr. Johnson, Coleridge and Arnold. Coleridge was a poet and he was written on criticism. What did we learn? The preface was written on the preface. 
بایوگرافی لٹری ایریا اس نے لکھا تھا ٹھیک ہے تو ایلیٹ بینگ اے پریکٹسنگ پوئٹ مس سٹیٹمنٹس آن پوئٹری اینڈ پوئٹس کیریڈ این ایڈیشنل اتھارٹی اینڈ اے گریٹر کنویکشن جو پہلے سارے پوئٹس ان کا ہم نے نام لیے یہ وہ پوئٹس تھے جنہوں نے پوئٹری چھوڑ دی تھی ایلیٹ واز ون آف دا پوئٹس واز اسٹل پریکٹسنگ پوئٹری سو وٹ ایور ہی ہیڈ ٹو سی اباؤٹ پوئٹری اباؤٹ پوئٹس اور وٹ اباؤٹ دا فلوسفی آف پوئٹری اٹ ہیز این ایڈیشنل اتھارٹی بیکاز سم ون ہوز ان ٹو دا ان دا پروفیشن ہی ووڈ بی کنسیڈرڈ مور ساؤنڈ اس کی جو مشورہ ہوگا اس کو ویٹ دیا جائے گا ٹھیک ہے اس کی بات کی ویٹیج ہوئے گی He called his criticism byproduct of my poetical workshop. His criticism was a result of whatever he was doing as a poet. Whatever he was practicing as a poet was a result of uh, whatever he wrote as a, cri a critic. So these two things, the poetry and the criticism, they were interlinked. When he wrote as a poet, he discovered a few things. He, dis he made a philosophy about how poetry was written, and then he would write a essay on criticism. And while he was writing an essay on criticism, he discovers something new. He, he founds a, a, a philosophy, and then he decides that this, this is the way the poetry should be written, and he would write a poem. So the two things were interlinked with each other. Okay, after Arnold, Eliot argued that criticism was a complementary activity to that of creativity. That is, that if you're involved in the process of creativity, uh, criticism would come. That's like you're getting something complimentary. You're going to buy a dress and you get a lipstick for complimentary. Okay, that's a complimentary thing. That's something that you have not bargained for, something that you have not paid for, and you get that. So he says whenever you're involved in the process of creativity, be it anything, whether it's, it's the part of um, uh, painting something, whether it's something, uh, you know, writing something it's writing poetry novel drama whatever because you're involved in the process you are the best judge of it as well uh, whether your judgment would be true or not that's a different question altogether but because you're involved in the process of creativity you know the intricacies of it a doctor would be a good critic of a doctor no so the poet would be a good critic of a poet that is why if you're involved in that process of creativity you'd be a good uh, critic for that person aap khana khate hain to jisko khana banana aata hoga wo us khane ki galti nikal sakega agar galti bhi nahi nikalega to uske andar jo cheez hui jo achhi koi cheez agar ki gayi hai to usko samajh aayegi ki khana salan jo hai wo aaj achhi tarah bhuna ہوا تھا یا یہ جو کیک بنایا گیا ہے اس کی آئسنگ کتنی اچھی ہوئی ہوئی ہے بیٹھی ہوئی ہے بالکل میلٹ نہیں ہوئی ہوئی تو جس کو پتا ہوگا وہی اس چیز کو اتنی چھوٹی چھوٹی انٹریکسیز کو اپریشیٹ کرے گا جن کو نہیں پتا ہوگا وہ تو چپ کر کے کھا جائیں گے ان کو کیا پتا چلے گا کہ اس میں ہلدی ڈلی کہ نہیں ڈلی ٹھیک ہے سو دا سیم تھنگ گوز ہیئر اف یو آر انوالو ان دا پروسیس آف کریٹیوٹی دین یو بی ایبل ٹو اپریشیٹ دس پروسیس آف دس پروسیس آف کرٹیسزم There is evidence of uh, keen perception and acute in his, uh, uh, in, his, in his remarks made by Eliot, especially in regard to the problems of his time, both as the critic and the poet. The virtues of a good critic, sensitiveness, erudition, sense of fact, generalizing power are to be found in uh, Eliot's critical pronouncements. So he was not a critic who would, you know, make statements just like that. There was this sensitivity in his soul. There was this profoundness in him. There was a sense of fact. And he generalized as well. It was not that he was particularly targeting something or he was particularly making statements on the basis of a particular piece of art. He would make a general statement, something that would apply to everything, something that is universal. It was not that he was making particular uh, philosophies about a particular piece of work, but he would uh, tell you things and tell you rules and philosophies that would apply to almost any piece of poetry. Okay? So he was uh, not uh, a very, uh, you know, uh, aloofish kind of a person. He would get involved in the problems of his times because he was a poet and his subject matter was the times of, his, uh, of, of the era that he was living in. The wasteland is entirely about the degeneration and the degradation of human race that was happening at that time after the First World War and there was this economic depression going on. So the whole generation uh, was under this acute depression. So ye uski jo abilities thi, ye sari ki sari uski poetry mein depicted thi. Ab jab wo ye keh raha hai ki jo bhi artist hai, wo اگر پوئٹ ہے تو وہ اچھا کرٹک بھی ہوگا کرٹیسزم آلریڈی کامس تو جب وہ پوئٹری بھی ان چیزوں کو انکلکیٹ کر رہا ہے تو یہی چیزیں جو ہے وہ اپنی اس کی کرٹیسزم میں بھی ہوں گی کہ ہی ووڈ ہیو این اوپن آئی این اوپن ایئرز ہی ووڈ ابزارب ایوری تھنگ دیٹ از ریٹن دیئر
he would uh, there is a evidence of keen perception and acute, uh, acute in his remarks made by Eliot especially in regard to the problem of his times both as the critic and the poet so he was a good critic as far as the problems of his time is concerned he was acutely aware of them and he was acutely aware of what was um, uh, written by other people and how well it was written how well it depicted the times and he would predict them as well he would uh, portray them in his poetry as well at the same time, he is the vision of a creative artist too. Okay? He is not only a critic and a moralist or a you know, preacher for that matter. There is a creative artist involved here as well. In his personality, when you assess him, there is this artist, a, a, you know, a painter of life, an interpreter of life that is present there. Creative artist, we talk about creative artists, we talk about basically such a person who is लाइफ को इंटरप्रेट कर रहा है जो लाइफ को जज कर रहा है जो लाइफ को आपके सामने उसी तरह प्रेजेंट कर रहा है जैसे कि वो है एंड ही वुड हैव दिस प्रोसेस ऑफ रिजनैलिटी एज वेल जिसमें ट्रेडिशन भी इन्वॉल्व होगी ये नहीं कि वो सिर्फ जस्ट टू द सेक ऑफ बीइंग ओरिजिनल ही डेविएट फ्रॉम द पाथ और द लिटरेरी हेरिटेज दैट ही हैज हिज अर्ली क्रिटिसिज्म इज इंडी डिफेंस ऑफ हिज ओन पोएट्री ठीक है ही स्टार्टेड आउट एवरीवन स्टार्ट्स आउट लाइक दैट ट्राइंग टू डिफेंड व्हाटएवर ही हैज व्हाटएवर ही हैज रिटन इट्स लाइक दैट यू राइट अ बुक ऑफ पोएम्स ठीक है कलेक्शन ऑफ पोएम्स आपके आपके पब्लिश हुई है तो आपके प्रीफेस में लिख देते हैं जैसे वर्ड्स वर्थ ने किया था ही रोड अ प्रोफेस और उसमें उसने लिख दिया कि जी मैंने इसलिए ये रोमांटिक पोएम्स लिखे दिस इज माय पर्पस एंड देन ही एक्सप्लेन एवरीथिंग व्हाई ही हैज डिविएटेड फ्रॉम द नॉर्मल पाथ सो हिज अर्ली क्रिटिसिज्म इज आल्सो बेस्ड ऑन व्हाटएवर ही थॉट वाज अम द रीजन ऑफ राइटिंग द पोएम्स एंड एक्सप्लेनिंग अवे हिज पोएट्री but that is so because he was writing a new kind of poetry take it just like wordsworth because wordsworth was writing a new kind of poetry eliot was writing a new kind of poetry so he had to write something to explain away whatever he was doing it was necessary to ed educate taste so that his different kind of poetry would find an audience exactly the same reason every time a poet finds that he has to give something new to the public or to the reader he would educate the, uh, the public first he would uh, make them uh, he would improve their taste uh, and educate them elucidate them tell them what he's writing why he's writing so that they're ready for it whenever it comes the mass of uh, eliot's reviews essays and published lectures fall into three periods theek okay? hai he uh, terms the first period the pre-christian decade that is from 1912 to 1928 in which there's a literary preoccupation mainly with the 16th and 17th century dramatists elizabethan poets or dramatists jo the did this period belong to sacred words home is to john dryden three essays and for lancelot andrews 1928 ये पहला पीरियड है इसका जी ठीक है जिसको वो प्री क्रिश्चियन डिकेट कहते हैं जब तक उस पर ये एंग्लिकन कैथलिक रिलीजन जो था सवार नहीं हुआ था सो ही हैड ही है विद एलिजबीद इन ड्रामाटिस्ट एंड द पोइट्स ठीक है जी एंड ही हैज रिटन दीज प्लेज दैट वी हैव ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड सेकेड वर्ड्स इन नाइनटीन हंड्रेड एंड जॉन ड्राइडन थ्री एस इन नाइनटीन हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी फोर एंड फॉर लैंसलेट लैंसलेट एंड जूस एस दैट ही रोड इन द सेकेंड पीरियड इज ऑफ सोशल एंड रिलीजियस क्रिटिसिजम ठीक है हमने शुरू में अगर आपको याद हो तो इलियट के एस एस की को थ्री पीरियड्स में डिवाइड किया था एक वो थ्री काइंड में डिवाइड किया था एक वो एस एस थे जो सोशल और रिलीजियस एस्पेक्ट्स पे थे दूसरे एस एस वो थे जो पोइट्स पे और राइटर्स पे थे और तीसरे एस एस वो थे जो कि क्रिटिकल एस एस थे फिलोसॉफिकल एस एस थे ठीक है जो सेकेंड पीरियड है उसमें मोस्ट ऑफ द एस एस देवर सोशल एंड रिलीजियस क्रिटिसिजम दे वर फॉलोइंग हिज कन्वर्जन एंड इंक्लूड्स दांते ठीक है दांते इज वन ऑफ द हाईलाइट्स ऑफ एस लाइफ ही इज द वन to bring him to the spotlight because dante ko usse pehle ignore kiya ja raha tha dante was a victorian poet and he was a demented poet for that matter he had too much creative energy in him which was trying to find a way out but couldn't he thoughts after lambeth 1931 and after strange gods 1934 ye uski uh, essays hai teen dante Uh, thoughts after Lambeth and after Strange Gods. ठीक है 1934 तक. अब 1934 तक आप सोच लें कि First World War हो चुकी है. और First World War में करोड़ों के हिसाब से इंसान जो थे इनको मार दिया गया था. In war of course. तो जब इंसान को अपनी existence की triviality का एहसास हो गया, तो फिर आप सोचें कि जो Wasteland जैसी poems हैं वो आएंगी. और जो writers हैं उनका viewpoint कैसे ज़िंदगी के बारे में और इंसान के बारे में change होगा. The third period is what Watson uh, terms as the post-war Olympian period.
which marks the renewal of interest in critical issues. Okay? Now this is the proposed war period is that the Second World War will happen. And this is when he is all to, uh, towards literature and the critical appreciation of literature. There are, says Watson, three voices of idiots as the critic. ठीक है अगर आप इलियट को डिस्कस करना चाहेंगे एज ए क्रिटिक तो उसकी तीन आवाजें हैं तीन डिफरेंट एंगल्स से वो बोलेगा तीन डिफरेंट साइड्स से आप उसकी बात सुन सकते हैं थ्री डिफरेंट पर्सनालिटीज इफ यू वांट टू कॉल इट सो फर्स्ट द यूथफुल एक्सप्लेटरी एंथ्यूजियाज्म ऑफ द ट्वेंटीज बिल्कुल शुरू की बात है ठीक है ही वॉज हैप्पी ही वॉज इंथ्यूजियास्टिक ही वॉज एक्सप्लेटरी एक्सप्लोर कर रहा था चीज़ों को ही वॉज यूथफुल एंड यूथ हैज इट्स ओन चार्म एंड एनर्जी where an almost ideal balance between poetic and critical activity is realized. Okay? It was the beginning of his literary career when he was writing poetry and he was writing criticism as well. He was writing criticism to balancing it to explain away his poetry. So this first phase is the ideal phase because there's this balance between the two things, the poetry and the criticism. Okay? He was youthful, he was um, adventurous, he was um, all full of charm and enthusiasm and it was all about uh, creativity, whether it be creative or poetic. The second, which uh, was traumatic tha, sort of for the entire world for that matter, second is an abortive of social and religious advocacy in frankly obscure nichest causes and third, a bold but exhausted attempt to recover the creative urge. Second, uh, every, I think every human being uh, on the planet at that time was uh, mentally disturbed because for the first time they realized the mass destruction human beings can cause on other human beings. So the second he was, he was having this religious urge in him and he was trying to you know, moralize and preach. So his second phase is very, if, you, if, if it's a better word to use, it, it was very boring. It was very mediocre for that matter. But the third period, third period was just a success to you know, gain the youth back try to be more creative again, which was of course not possible, followed at once by denial and desperation. You know, when you try to recapture your youth, um, you always end up being bitter. So the same thing happened to Eliot here. He tried to recapture his youth, he tried to get back the urge of creation again, but this did not happen. So uh, it was followed by denial and desperation, he got, you know, of course depressed. These three voices of Eliot, the critic, according to Watson, are clear and distinct. And uh, according to Watson, there is no way that you can confuse it. There's no blurring here. The boundaries are very clear and distinct. First is this youthful person who's energetic and adventurous and happy uh, and creating a balance uh, between the process of creativity and uh, the criticism. Okay, poetry or criticism is unbalanced. The second is the post-war. Isme, it's the, there is this religious and social element because of the of the state of the society, or the state of the nation, and um, it's all about you know morality and religion and uh, stuff like that. Um, the third uh, is uh, the way is it's an attempt to carry to get back whatever was there in the first period, but he was not successful there. As a result of it, there was denial and depression. These three voices very very clear in Eliot's works as a critic. In Eliot's later criticism, evening uh, social and religious uh, criticism, uh, we find races and elements what he had written in the purely literary essays at the beginning of his career. In Irving Babbitt and Humanism and Notes Towards the Definition of Culture, there's much that is already there in his early essays. His later criticism was um, mostly about social and religious criticism. Uh, we find that there are certain elements of racial uh, ethnicity or elements of his literary essays in the beginning of his essays, they were end cases. In the beginning of his essays, if they were only traces, they were completely profound. In Irving Babbitt and Humanism and Notes Towards the Definition of Culture, there's much uh, that is already there in his early essays. Basically, we have discussed that the third period of essays, uh, criticism, the third period of, uh, as a critic, jo tha, wo basically it was just a repetition. It was just an attempt to regain whatever he has done before. So, in attempt, he has failed many times. And the essays in the third period were written, they basically were the essays, they were the topics, they were deliberate, they were deliberate, they were the discourse. Kar there was nothing new in the last part of his. Uh, critical career. So his social criticism cannot be said to be completely different or opposed to his views on literature. Okay? 
جو وہ لٹریچر میں سمجھ رہا تھا کہ چیزیں ہونی چاہیے کسی بھی پیس آف پوئٹری میں کسی بھی پیس آف ناول میں کسی بھی ڈراما میں جو چیزیں ہونی چاہیے وہی چیزیں اس کے خیال میں سوسائٹی میں ہونی چاہیے تھی وہ سوسائٹی کو اور لٹریچر کو ایک دوسرے سے الگ نہیں کر سکتا تھا اور نہ کرنا چاہتا تھا ہی بلیو دیٹ دیز ٹو تھنگس آر ٹوگیدر دے انٹر ریلیٹڈ سوسائٹی از اے ڈپکشن آف دا لٹریچر اینڈ دا لٹریچر از آلویز اے پوٹری آف دا سوسائٹی اینڈ اٹس دا بوتھ آف دیم دے آر این انٹرپریٹیشن آف دا لائف دیٹس ہیپننگ اراؤنڈ اس So the desire for discipline and order, the search for an outside authority and the submission of the individual to this authority and getting salvation through faith are expressed in his literary as well as in his social and religious writing. The element in Eliot's poems, in his literature or in his criticism, that there has to be, uh, he was a stickler for a tradition uh, and he believes in his impersonality of art or that he believed that uh, there has to be an outside authority and thus an individual should, you know, escape and then which was subjugated to that outside authority and there was this getting salvation getting release getting um, hope through through faith um, they were expressed in his literature but they were also uh, present in the society at that time so jab wo social essays likhta tha to unme bhi wohi tha jo uski poetry thi usme wohi tha critical aspects bhi uske yahi the jin pe wo focus kar raha tha so he was a man who was quite convinced who he was a man of conviction and he knew what he was talking about one sees in elias critical career an integrated approach ساری چیزیں اس کے جو کرٹیکل اپروچ تھی اس کے اندر یہ سارے ایلیمنٹس اکٹھے تھے انٹیگریٹڈ تھے آپس میں جیسے انٹیگریٹڈ اسکلز ہوتی ہے نا کہ آپ کی لسننگ اسپیکنگ رائٹنگ اور ریڈنگ اکٹھی ہوتی ہے اس کو آپ انٹیگریٹڈ اسکلز کہتے ہیں اسی طرح ایلیٹ کے کرٹیسزم میں یہ سارے ایلیمنٹس جو تھے دے وائر انٹیگریٹڈ ٹوگیدر ایلیٹ نیور ریئلی چینجڈ اینی آف ہز ویوز کمپلیٹلی ایٹ دا موسٹ ہی ماڈیفائڈ دیم دس از ہاؤ شوز از میچورٹی ایز اے کرٹک ایف یو آر اے کرٹک اینڈ یو ہیو اے پوائنٹ آف ویو اینڈ یو ہیو اے فلاسفی اٹس اٹس آلموسٹ اسینشیل دیٹ یو ڈو ناٹ چینج دیم آن ویم یو شوڈ ناٹ بی ایزلی کنوینسڈ یو آر گیونگ آؤٹ اے فلاسفی یو آر گیونگ آؤٹ اے تھیری یو شوڈ اسٹک ٹو یور تھیری یو شوڈ بی سو کنوینسڈ ان دا فرسٹ پلیس وین یو آر ہینڈنگ آؤٹ اے فلاسفی ٹو دا ریسٹ آف دا ورلڈ یو شوڈ بی شور دیٹ دس از واٹ یو بلیو ان So he has, it, it, it speaks good for him, it speaks highly of him that he has never changed his uh, views. He has, uh, you know, modified his views somehow, somewhere, but it's, it's never, you know, a 180 degree turn, not even a 90 degree turn. Okay, so that's 20 degree, or there's a difference between the shade, there's a difference between the shade. It was not, never that he has completely negated his thoughts or that he has gone on the other way. Eliot's best work as the critic lies in his early work. His earlier essays were the ones which played a great part in changing the outlook and attitude to the literature of the past. And in these essays, the best known of which are tradition and the individual talent, the metaphysical poets, John Dryden, Andrew Marvel, four Elizabethan dramatist, Hamlet, Ben Jonson, we find his critical method at its best. Okay? These essays are the names of which I have taken, which is the tradition, individual, tradition and individual talent, metaphysical poets, John Dryden, Andrew Marvel, uh, Elizabeth, the four Elizabethan dramatist, Hamlet, Ben Jonson. This critical method, if you want to understand how he works, what his criticism was all about, you have to read these essays. It was the best work that is written on his beginning portion. And this played a great part in changing the outlook, literary outlook, the way we assess literature of the past. So this was his job to make us look at the literature of the past in a different way and he was quite successful in doing it. So Eliot illustrates his theory of how a critic should practice. It involves elucidation. We have discussed in the function of critics that he believes that, uh, that uh, a critic has a particular function and he should be aware. Now, he doesn't focus on personality as Coleridge has done, that the critic should be aware of this personality. Like Wordsworth said, or like Aristotle said, that the poet should be aware of this personality as well. No. He said, what is his function? He said, what is his function? So, what is his function? He said, what is his function? It involves elucidation. He should, you know, point out, bring uh, to prominence, bring to uh, bring to front things that are important, things that people should notice. He should have uh, this uh, tool of comparison and contrast. He should be able to compare two pieces of work. He should be able to point out the contrast between two pieces of work, how the two differ, and what are the similarities and dissimilarities in two pieces of work, or how is it how is it uh, different from life? How is it different from the society in which it's portrayed? This is his inability to make generalization on the basis of um, on the basic problems of poetic creativity 
he should be able to he should be a, 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 he should, should make generalization on the basic problems of poetry creativity ke poetry likhi jaye to wo aise hi likhi jaye he should have this uh, idea in him ke poetry likhne ka koi ek tarika nahi hota poetry likhne ke bahut se tarike ho sakte hain theek hai and the central important features of an author how an author what should be the qualities present in an author how he should you know the wo jo cheez humne padhi thi na ki he should separate his person from the uh, suffering and suffering from the art the, these kinds of thing so aim of his criticism was to stimulate the reader into thought making his own conclusions the eliot was not there to tell the reader what to think he was there to lay out the facts to tell the readers this is what there is in the book this is what there is in the poem in the novel or in the drama um, um and this is i'm going to tell you what's good and what's not good now you have to make your own decision you have to reach your, reach to your own conclusion so eliot put forward his critical opinions in a language clear consists concise and as far as possible cynically accurate Eliot's critical methods was necessary necessarily accurate theek hai acha uski language jo uski poetry mein bhi language thi wo bhi clear thi concise thi precise thi aur accurate thi uski jo critical method tha wo bhi accurate tha theek hai accurate ka matlab ye hota hai ki wo subjective nahi tha objective tha it means ki there was no room left for people to make their own interpretations whatever he wanted to say he said it out right in black and white so this is an aspect of his classicism and we have discussed ki classical poetry your classical criticism kya hota tha usme yehi hota tha na ki subjectivity nahi hoti thi objective hota tha to the point baat hoti thi accurate hoti thi wo baat hum bahut dafa kar chuke hain geometrical precision wali to wo is pe apply hoti hai so eliot's critical method was necessarily the result of an intense and highly conscious work of critical intelligence theek hai uh he had this ability to analyze things he had this ability to look for the merits and demerits of things he had the ability to point out to elucidate whatever there was in a piece of art so as a result of that critical mind that is why his criticism was so accurate f r leve points out eliot's best his important criticism has an immediate relation to his technical problems as the poet who at that moment in his history was faced with altering expression His criticism is remarkable for its directness and its concentrated purity of interest. ठीक है उसका जो इशू था ये था कि जो उसकी पोइट्री थी वो उसके टाइम से डिफरेंट थी ठीक है लेकिन जो उसका क्रिटिसिजम था इट डिट फेस दैट प्रॉब्लम इट वॉज हिस क्रिटिसिजम वॉज रिमार्केबल बिकॉज इट वॉज डायरेक्ट एंड इट वॉज कंसनट्रेटेड कंसनट्रेटेड बिकॉज ही वॉज इंटरेस्टेड इन हिस वर्क बिकॉज यू वर इंटरेस्टेड इन हिस वर्क सो ही वॉज नेवर फ्लेकी ही वॉज नेवर स्केची सो ही स्टेज टू द पॉइंट एंड ही न्यू वॉट ही वॉज डूइंग ही न्यू वॉट ही वॉज सेंग सो वेन ही न्यू वॉट ही वॉज सेंग सो दे वॉज नो प्रॉब्लम इन प्रोडिक्टिंग वट एवर ही वॉन्टेड टू से Eliot's concept of tradition is different from that of the Augustans. ठीक है? To Eliot, tradition is living. It is dynamic. It grows. The past affects the present. The present affects the past. Classics, the new classics, the Augustans. In के लिए तो past freeze हो गया था Augustan age में. Augustan age of the Emperor Augustus. और वो उसको completely follow कर रहे थे. The Eliot tradition is living. It's dynamic. The past is not dead and distinctly not removed from the present. They are part of each other. The past and the present. The past is a continuum of the present. The present, it's um, directly related to the past. So for him, it was not dead and gone. It was there, very much pulsating and living and affecting the present as well as the future. The past is always present. It lives on, evolves to the present. That is what a sense of tradition means to Eliot. it implies a consciousness of the presenters of the past and of the timelessness of tradition the concept of tradition is basic to eliot's critical opinions it forms the basic of the impersonal theory of poetry as it does his idea of what the critic should do theek hai ji iski jo theory aapne tradition ki thi na agar aapko wo samajh aa gayi hai to iska matlab hai ki aapko eliot ki samajh aa gayi hai eliot ki theory of tradition was the base the core of his critical theory this is what he believed as an artist as a critical artist as a critic he believed that you have to you have to believe in tradition you have to stick to tradition it does not mean that the tradition is the imitation of the past it is something that is ever growing that is a past of the present the present is present in the past and the past is present in the past and the present as well they interlink to each other ye jo iski lines hai it implies a consciousness of the presenters of the past ki the past ke jo presenters hain jo past mein jo logon ne likha hai aur jo ab usko present kar rahe hain they should be conscious of the fact ki past is not dead it's not long gone 
and the timelessness of the tradition. It's, it's timeless. Things that have been written, things, pieces of literature, poems, writers, novels, these are not things that are for a specific period of time. Timeless hai wo. They live forever, the universal. The concept of tradition is basic to English critical opinion. It forms the basic um, of the impersonal theory of the poetry as it does of his idea of what a critic should do. Jo bhi uski aage ki sari theories hai, wo sab ki sab is theory pe base karti hai. Uski impersonal theory of art pe base, impersonal theory of art jo hai, uski function of critic jo hai, wo sab uski theory of tradition pe base karta hai. Eliot brought a fresh approach to the literature of the past. He raised uh, traditional English poetry uh, from Chaucer through Shakespeare, the metaphysicals, Dryden and Poet. So he went through the entire thing. If you start with English poetry, start kahan se hoti? Chaucer se start with Chaucer. Chaucer se start karke, he went through uh, all the way through uh, a Pope, Alexander Pope. And Pope ke baare mein uske kuch nahi the. And part of Wordsworth and Keats to the present times. Hai? And he brought over how this tradition was valid for the sensibility of his own period. Ab usne phir ye proof kiya through time. Usne Chaucer ko discuss kiya, Shakespeare ko kiya, Dryden ko kiya, Pope ko kiya, Metaphysicals ko kiya, words with the Keats ko bhi kiya. Phir usne ye proof kiya ki ye jo sensibility jis ki wo baat karta hai, jo unification of sensibility hai. How is it important? Tradition. How tradition is important for this unification of sensibility? He says that I am carrying this tradition for the Metaphysicals. Jame unse ye tradition mein follow kar raha hoon, to mene unification of sensibility ki hai. Or mene unification of sensibility ki hai, to poetry ki revival hua hai. Poetry, jo dissociation of sensibility settle in ho gai thi, usse nikli hai baayir. This was a statement of perspective which made his contemporaries take a different look at the literature of the past. This general statement of the living English literary tradition compelled critics to alter their outlook. So instead of considering the literature that has been written in the past obsolete and long gone and not of any use, he changed this perspective and it made the people look at literature of the past in a different way. How it was affecting the present literature. Is ki jo example Eliot apni poetry se de di hai. Ki usne basically wohi stream of uh, poetry follow ki hai. Jo ki metaphysicals ki thi. Ye jo lesser known Elizabethan poets ki thi. Eliot's attitude towards critics uh, was a uh, criticism was classical. Chike classical um, uh, criticism humne para hai ki ye wo critics the jo believe karte the ki there has to be an affinity with the past if you want to prove something and they believe that there has to be an outside authority and they have to be objective as well. So it opposed to the uh, uh, sound of the inner voice and subjective criticism that was essentially romantic in nature. So he was completely against the romantic frame of mind. We know that. He, he believed that they were fragmentary, they were uh, immature and they didn't have much to say. So he was against that. So when he was against that, of course, the pure classical could follow Kartata. His important contribution to criticism was the insistence on complete objectivity. Okay? Usne kaha ke the poet or the critic, he has to be objective. He has to be precise, concise. There should be no room for uh, extra emotion there. His was a reaction against romanticism and humanism. Criticism should not show any shade of personal uh, prejudice. He believed that it has to be this impersonality, that the person, or the poet, or the critic, he should not have his personality depicted in the work that he is doing. Chai wo creative work ho, chai wo criticism ho. Uski personal likes and dislikes, uski personal prejudices, uski biases jo hain, wo criticism mein bhi aur poetry mein bhi nahi aani chahiye. Thik hai? There is no place for subjectivism in criticism. The poetry, uh, the criticism has to be objective. It cannot be subjective. A critic has to uphold objective standards. And sense of tradition was important in gaining this objective. Achha, if there has to be objective standards, it means that things have to follow a certain rule. If you have to follow a certain rule, what rule can be better than the rules of the ancients or the literary heritage? That is why tradition for him was important. Okay? A poem should be appreciated as a poem, as a work of art. The poem and not the poet should be the concern of a literary critic. Poet ki personality, uska time period, uski um, social context, uski social supremacy, uska social rank, uski race, uski ethnicity, kisi tera bhi critic ko affect nahi karni chahiye. Critic ka concern nahi hai. It, the only concern of the critic is the work of art, that is the poem that he has written. 
a respect for order, discipline, and a sense of tradition were necessary for a critic. A critic has to be an organized person. It's not that you one day you set up and you say that I'm going to, you know, indulge myself and write a critical appreciation of something, something. So you have to be an ordered person, you have to be a disciplined person, you have to have this sense of tradition in you as well. Sense of tradition ke liye, of course you have to be exposed to whatever has been written before by the ancients. Eliot's classicism is manifest in his theory of poetry. Uh, this again was a clear reaction against the romantic and the humanistic schools of thought. He insisted that the poet should subject his personal self to the discipline of absorbing literary tradition. Tradition and the individual talent should be read along with the function of critics. जब आप tradition और uh, individual talent की बात करें तो आपको उसके साथ functional of critic भी पढ़ना चाहिए क्योंकि जब ये दोनों ऐसे जब पढ़ेंगे तो तभी आपको समझ आएगी कि Eliot असल में चाह क्या रहा था आपसे Eliot ये चाहता है कि a person who is creating something has to keep himself, his personality, his experiences, his prejudices, likes, his likes separate. Similarly, a critic who is analyzing a piece of literature should keep his personal likes and dislikes uh, away from the process of judgment. So he has to be absor he has to be disciplined, and he has to be disciplined above uh, 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 enough to absorb the tradition because what tradition will help karegi uh, to, to remain objective. His theory of criticism is related to his theory of poetry. Impersonality is a basic essential in both. ठीक है. Tradition में भी impersonality चाहिए. Tradition होगी तो आप उसकी जो theory of poetry है, उसमें impersonality से लिया ना क्योंकि impersonality होगी तो उसकी जो poetry और criticism दोनों पे apply करेगी. अगर impersonality होगी तो criticism भी impartial होगा, poetry भी जो कि इसका purpose था कि poetry जो है वो objective होनी चाहिए. तो वो भी तभी achieve हो सकता है. This theory has a great deal of impact. Um, I question basically, it question basically the existing ideas and give a fresh direction to thought. Generally, if you, are, if you are, you know, writing something new, something novel, something original, then you would consider that you are a good poet. So, this theory of poetry or theory of criticism came to change a lot of things. It gave a new direction to everything that was being written at that time. So as it went against existing concepts, it has been called a revolutionary theory of poetry. Just because it was different, existing trends kya the Victorians the, um, to unki to against jari thi, and because it was against the Victorians as well as the Romantics, ek two centuries piche tak it was you know flattening, flattening everything that was done at in the English literature as far as poetry or criticism goes. So that is why it was considered a revolutionary theory. The greatest theory on the nature of the poetic process after the Romantic theory put forward by Wordsworth. So, this methodology is almost the same as Wordsworth, because Wordsworth gave us a new thing and became all the trends. Similarly, Elit gave us a new thing and this was Wordsworth's mode that he wrote poems and then he explained why he was writing these poems. So, it was almost the same thing. The Romantics considered poetry to be the expression of personal emotions and the very personality of the poet. Romantics, poet ki personality ko, poet ki emotions ko, poetry se alag nahi gar sakte te. They believed ki poetry has to be an expression of, it has to be a portrayal of the emotions and the personality of the poet. This concept is firmly rejected by Eliot. Eliot ne to impersonal theory pe focus kiya na, objective standards pe focus kiya. He considered poetry to be not letting loose of emotion. Poetry was not there to express emotions, but an escape from emotion. You have to get away from them. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. It is not, adverse, as words were stated, a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings or emotions reconnected in tranquility. They are two extremes, Eliot and Wordsworth. Eliot ne kaha ke there has to be no emotion, no personality, no tranquility. And Wordsworth say there has to be emotion, there has to be recollection, there has to be tranquility. So these two people, they're quite opposite to each other. Eliot, however, does not deny personality or emotion to the poet. The poet ha can have personality and emotion. He merely demands that the man who feels or experience, that is the poet's personality, he separates from the artist's mind which creates. What is demand that you have a personality? Your personality will feel, your personality will undergo an experience. But you have to keep it separate from the poet's mind. The person's personality should be separate from the mind that is going to do the creativity, that is going to indulge in the creative process.
the personal feeling and emotions of the man in the poet should be transformed into the artistic emotions something which is universal and impersonal dekhiye ji humne ye decide kiya tha ki if you are being impersonal then you are supposed to choose ordinary emotions okay you're not supposed to create emotions or invent emotions the emotions are already there what you would do you would use those ordinary emotions and build them into a poem in such a way that they give rise to feelings which were not actually associated with those emotions originally and these feelings would be present in most of the normally constituted people it means ki wo unki appeal jo hai wo universal hogi general hogi Just the man and the poet, they are two different things. They have to be separate, according to Eliot. Words with a very different thing. So, as such, criticism should be focused on the poetry and not on the poet. Okay? Eliot thus changes the direction of critical theories. पहले होता था कि आपने poet को focus करना उसकी उसके जो contribution towards literature है, development of a particular genre है, उस पे आप focus करते थे. Eliot ने इसको change, इसकी direction ही change. कि दूसरी का आपने सिर्फ poetry पे focus करना है. His theory is shoes biographical, psychological or sociological factors which are irrelevant to the criticism of poetry. उसने सारे ये elements, biological, sociological, psychological and historical or what whatever the reason kisi tarah bhi us poet se connected the us in sare um, factors ko uh, irrelevant karar dete aur us in sare factors ko khatam kar diya so eliot's essay on the metaphysical poets brought about a reevaluation re of these poets theek hai they were not considered uh, uske kafi mazak ho raha tha if you remember samuel johnson jab humne kaavle padha tha to he said they, it was a race of poets jo affected the affectations thi jinki personality mein so they were not considered very good poets or poets of great caliber isne unki reassessment karai hai isne unko forefront pe leke aaye hai so dan and the other poets of the 17th century had been appreciated before theek hai the people considered they conceived to be you know good enough but it was eliot however who brought about a significant revival of interest in these poets in the 20th century it is due to him that interest began to be taken in jacobian dramatists jacobian dramatists jinko completely ignore kar diya gaya tha because you know what happened there was this fall of drama he was the one who was bringing to the front people who have been ignored jo reassessment of literature ki baat hi karta hai bar bar it it is so much applicable to him that he has reassessed literature usne kaha ki ab ye nayi theories hain and now we are going to think like this and if we think like this let us assess literature that has been written before us let us look at literature in a different way and let us uh, judge them differently and bring people who have been ignored before to the forefront his approach to dryden pope and augustine brought about a reinstatement of these poets in the living history uh, in living english uh, literary tradition in each cases he sheds fresh light on the writers work theek hai usne dobara se analyze kiya usne dryden ko analyze kiya pope ko kiya augustine ko dobara analyze kiya wo jo itne bade bade kya kehte hain unko satoon the itne bade bade minar the burj the for that matter they were thrown down face down Uh, in each case he sheds fresh light on the writer's work there is a concise precise and helpful analysis of their works theek okay? hai it was it, it was impartial as well it was concise and it was precise and it was helpful as well if you want to make your judgment on a particular writer read eliot the suggestive uh, which leads the reader to make his own conclusion he would just tell you that these are the things present in the uh, in this uh, poet's works he's not telling you how to think He's just telling you that ये था इसमें ये था इसमें ये था ऐसे लिखा था ऐसी language इस मालूम हुई थी अब आप judge करें कि ये अच्छा था कि बुरा था ये आपका decision है. It is thought his method that Eliot just it is through this method that Eliot reevaluates the earlier writers. All the statement may not be acceptable, the ability to provoke thought, however, cannot be denied. ठीक है जो तीन statements उसने इन writers के बारे में उसने sub writers को इस तरह से किया. उसने इन राइटर्स के बारे में जितनी भी स्टेटमेंट्स दी हैं वो सारी की सारी स्टेटमेंट्स जो हैं वो आप उनको नहीं कह सकते कि वो सब स्टेटमेंट्स एक्यूरेट है और एक्सेप्टेबल है बट ईच एंड एवरी स्टेटमेंट डज मेक यू थिंक and that is the purpose that is what he was doing it that was his job as a critic that's what he think the function of critic is to make the writer to make the reader think and to make a judgment on his own so this is about all and we have discussed so far 
uh, the entire course of uh, literary criticism. We started uh, with uh, different kinds of literary criticism. We discussed the historical literary criticism, we discussed feminism, we discussed psychological literary criticism, we discussed the definitions and so on. We moved on to Plato and we discussed K how Plato uh, started. He made his an academy, he wrote this book Republic and in his book he created an idle um, uh, state in which uh, there was a uh, little place for the poets because he considered them to be unnecessary. definitions uske pari thi ki what according to him was what according to him was poetry and how it was important whether it should be practiced in a state or not. We moved on to Plato's um, student Aristotle and we had a, a long discussion about poetics and according to Aristotle what were the main features of a classical tragedy. और उसमें क्या क्या इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट्स होते हैं कितने 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 फैक्टर्स अगर पूरे हो जाएं तो ट्रेजेडी जो है वो कंप्लीट ट्रेजेडी कहलाती है ठीक है फिर हम आगे चले और हमने सैमुअल जॉनसन को पढ़ा सैमुअल जॉनसन में हमने मिल्टन पे उसका क्रिटिसिज्म था और मेटाफिजिकल पोइट्स पे जिनमें काउले पे था लेकिन हमने सिर्फ उसका इतना सा पोर्शन पढ़ा था कि हाउ ही एनालाइज्ड मेटाफिजिकल पोइट्स मिल्टन पे और काउले पे सैमुअल जॉनसन का क्रिटिसिज्म जो था वो डिस्क्रिप्टिव क्रिटिसिज्म था ही चोज अ राइटर एंड देन ही चोज टू इलुसिडेट अबाउट हिज मेरिट्स एंड डीमेरिट्स ईच एंड एवरी वर्क ऑफ दैट राइटर ठीक है जी उसने मिल्टन को काफी ज्यादा अप्रिशिएट किया बट ही हैड हिज ओन आइडियाज अबाउट हिज फॉल्स दैट मिल्टन वाज नॉट Uh, good enough to in, entice a reader. He was not good enough to uh, make a reader hook up to the uh, process of reading. You can you can easily put the book down and never pick it up again ever. उसके बाद हम move किए और हमने words with start किया. अब जी जो words with था इसमें हमने उसका प्रीफेस्ट टू लिरिकल बैलेट को बेसिकली फोकस किया था और उसकी जो थेरीज थी अबाउट हिज डेफिनेशन ऑफ पोइट्री हिज नेचर ऑफ अकॉर्डिंग टू हिम द नेचर ऑफ पोइट्री द फंक्शन ऑफ पोइट्री द पर्सनालिटी ऑफ अ क्रिटिक व्हाट काइंड ऑफ अ पर्सन अ क्रिटिक शुड बी एंड व्हाट शुड बी द फंक्शन ऑफ दैट क्रिटिक so we moved on from uh, words with to t s coleridge and t s coleridge and words with both romantics but coleridge to se deviate kar jata hai uh, is tarah ke wo words with kuch cheezon pe disagree karta hai aur coleridge mein basically humne wo cheeze bhi discuss ki thi jo uska criticism tha words with ke upar jo usne words with ke marriage to demarriage ko discuss kiya tha uske alawa coleridge ke humne definition of poetry bhi padhi aur uski jo definition of critics thi uske khayal mein jo function of critics tha jo definition of poetry nature of poetry function of poetry ultimate purpose of poetry we discussed all that then we moved on towards um, matthew arnold who was uh, a late romantic early is come victorian romantic sketchman he was a poet but he uh, moved on to be a critic and he was a uh, he was like eliot he believed uh, in uh, objectivity and he believed in classicism he believed that people should uh, follow the classes तो उसकी थेरी में फिर उसने एक हमें दिया था कि देर हैज टू बी पोइटिक एक्सेलेंस एंड पोइटिक एक्सेलेंस के देर हैज टू बी दिस टच स्टोन मैथड दैट ही अप्लाइड अब फिर हम फाइनली हम टी एस इलियट पे आए हैं और टी एस इलियट जो कि मेरे ख्याल में अभी तक के पढ़े जाने वाले सारे क्रिटिक्स में से सबसे ज्यादा जिसमें डेप्थ थी और जो सबसे ज्यादा क्लियर था अपनी फिलोसफीज के बारे में एरस्टोटल को भी आई गिव अ लॉट ऑफ यू नो वेटेज बट द रेस्ट ऑफ दैम आई थिंक दे दे नॉट एज प्रोफाउंड एज आई फाउंड टी एस इलियट और टी एस इलियट ने फिर हमें अपनी डिफरेंट थेरीज बताई जिसमें इसमें उसकी थेरी ऑफ ट्रेडिशन एंड इंडिविजुअल आर्ट थी फिर उसकी इम्पर्सनल थेरी थी ऑब्जेक्टिव को रिलेटिव था यूनिफिकेशन ऑफ सेंसिबिलिटी थी डिसोसिएशन ऑफ सेंसिबिलिटी थी एंड फाइनली वी डिस्कस एंड फंक्शन ऑफ क्रिटिक्स भी थे एंड फाइनली वी डिस्कस हाउ हिज क्रिटिसिज्म इट अफेक्टेड लिटरेचर द हिस्ट्री ऑफ लिटरी क्रिटिसिज्म ऑन द होल एंड विद दिस वी कम टू एन एंड ऑफ इंग्लिश फोर फाइव फोर लिटरी क्रिटिसिज्म थैंक यू वेरी मच